Good morning, church. So thank you, Josh. Thank you for the team. Thank you for Eli for stepping in for drums today. Usually I'm on drums. I wasn't doing it today. Bang up job. Um, also, welcome back to the youth. Uh, hello to everyone online, everyone on vacation, everyone traveling. Um, it's really good to have the youth back, uh, as well as my wife, Becky. Uh, she was one of the volunteers for the youth trip um, this past week. And um, we happen to be big office uh, fans in our house. And this past week reminded me of the one episode where Dwight quit, um, uh, quit the office, and he's one of the characters. And he was gone, and all of a sudden, lots of little things throughout the house weren't being done, and, or uh, lots of things weren't, weren't happening in the office. And people didn't notice it until it started happening. And this, this week kind of felt a little like that uh, in a sense of you just don't notice all the little things that happen throughout the house to keep, like, myself alive, our son alive, our cats alive, everything. Um, so it's good to have her home. Uh, very appreciative that I have just such an awesome partner um, to just make all this so easy. So if, so if you've been granted time, um, off for this 4th of July holiday, I hope it was a convenient opportunity for some rest and relaxation. But July 4th is a state holiday. And um, if my impression is correct, from a Mennonite Anabaptist perspective, we really don't celebrate the 4th of July because while we're citizens of the United States, more important, we're citizens of God's kingdom. So where Jesus is our king, so, yeah, we're living in an empire. The U.S., I mean, if you look at your history books, the United States is an empire. I mean, we're, we're essentially the Roman Empire on a global and economic scale. And just like the days of ancient Rome, many of us could be like the Apostle Paul. Our citizenship in the U.S. grants us lots of rights and privileges. So the question is, can we be like Paul to use the rights we have today, the privileges we have today, to advance the kingdom of God? On one hand, the empire, the United States, I mean, it's very permissive. And by that, I mean there's many legal things we can do. And there's some other things that are legal that can be considered sinful in our eyes. There's also a lot of cultural norms today, norms that we might be following even right now and not recognize that we have blind spots that we might refuse to acknowledge that are also sinful. But with all that being said, can we notice all of these modern day systems, these norms, these laws? Can we twist some of them like Paul used his citizenship, looked at the cultural norms and said, hey, I've got a better kingdom. Jesus is his kingdom. And that's how we spread the gospel. So that's kind of the topic for today, but not the topic for the day. So, but just coming off of July 4th weekend, it's a nice reminder. So if you just want to think about that through the rest of my time I'm sharing and just start spacing out, have fun with that. If not, it was a good, so if you're just thinking about that for the rest of the day, today's a productive day. You've got the point, yay. So today we're going to absorb an entire chapter of uh, Ecclesiastes, chapter, chapter number 10. And as, we prepared, as I was preparing for this and I reread it a few times, here's my initial thoughts on this particular chapter. One. It's weird. Two, it does not feel like Ecclesiastes. This book, this chapter, actually feels like a leftover from Proverbs. So it's like out of the 31 chapters in Proverbs, like Solomon and, and his guy and his scribes are like, we got some good stuff here. We can't fit in a proverb. Eh, we'll just throw it into chapter 10. In fact, so if you look at diff different translations of the Bible, there's, in the RSV translation, the header for this chapter is actually called Miscellaneous Observations. So with all that being said, um, I'm going to try to take advantage that this passage is on July 4th because it's, it's very uh, timely uh, because we're going to draw out a few contrasts. So we're going to go through all of chapter 10. I'm going to read all 20 verses right now. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 1. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Even as fools walk along the road, they lack sense and show everyone how stupid they are. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. 
there is an evil I have seen under the sun, the sort of error that arises from a ruler. Fools are put in many high positions, while the rich occupy low ones. I have seen slaves on horseback, while princes go on foot like slaves. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stone may be injured by them. Whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. If a snake bites before it is charmed, the charmer receives no fee. Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. At the beginning, their words are folly. At the end, they are wicked madness. And fools multiply words. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell someone else what will happen after them? The toil of fools wearies them. They do not know the way to town. Woe to the land whose king was a servant and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed is the land whose king is of noble birth and whose princes eat at proper time for strength and not drunkenness. Through laziness, the rafters sag. Because of idle hands, the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. Do not revile the king even in your thoughts or curse the rich in your bedroom because a bird in the sky may carry your words and a bird on the wing may report what you say. See what I mean? It, it feels like a big old hodgepodge. So at first glance, I really don't see a theme. You don't see a theme. And I mean, there's over nine things mentioned just in those 20 verses. You see dead flies, you see fools, you see snake charming, you see kings, rulers, princes, you see axe wielding, you see speaking, laziness, eating, drunkenness, drunkenness, and last, tattling or telling. So what do we do with this? How do we unpack this? And that's my goal for the rest of the, uh, uh, of, of the time sharing. I'm going to look for like an overarching theme for the chapter, and then from that theme, we're going to try to apply something for today. So before I do that, um, I first need to put my cards on the table and expose a mental worldview or biblical view I have um, as I read this. Or let me, let me just say, I had some preconceptions about these books. So this book is about a Solomon. This book was attributed to be being written by Solomon, the king. So if you've, you know, read the, through the entire Bible, and if you're doing the, the Bible um, uh, with us, uh, you know, year through the Bible, what you'll notice is you'll see the book of Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And that's a very, it's called, sometimes called the Deuteronomic history. In those books, what you're seeing is a, a grand picture saying that we need a monarchy, the monarchy is good. So in my mind, I'm going through uh, in my head of, because this is from Solomon and Ecclesiastes, there's an overarching or underlying current saying monarchy good, kings are good. So yes, there are some bad kings, as we'll see uh, in, in the book of Kings as well as Chronicles. But one thread weaving all of those books together is monarchy good. So I just want to kind of point that out there. And then next is, uh, as we get back to the text, let's imagine this whole chapter is a composition. So we have an introduction, we have a swelling, and then we have some finale in the ending. And I want to try to generate a, um, a theme around this. So I want to throw out one more thing, too. I'm not overly confident in this interpretation, because, but that's, that's the beautiful thing about uh, God's Word in the Bible, is we can come to this at looking at it from an ancient perspective through a modern perspective and actually take circumstances for today and come out with, varying contrasting opinions and all of them can be valid because when are they applicable to my life right now and because this is a holiday weekend july 4th weekend um it's kind of fortuitous that this chapter was on a holiday weekend especially of july 4th so let's walk through these chap let's walk through these verses one by one so what we see here is we see a little bit of something can ruin a lot of something else. For example, too much salt can ruin a dish. Or worse, if you have like a drink, I pour, li like this could be a full of, full of good liquid, 
and I just put a little dirt or something else in it, and boom, it becomes unusable. Or let's say I've spent a lifetime, like I've been at my job for about 26 years, um, I can do something stupid and ruin my reputation there. So one, one, little, um, one little thing, um, my reputation can be ruined by a blunder. So one lesson out of here could be little things can have big or oversized consequences. As we see in verse 2 and 3, we see a move towards fools and wisdom, or fools and the wise. So I'm going to also say, when I look at verse 2 and going to the right and left, honestly, I have no idea what that means. I'm going to say it right now. I could dig into that and probably spend another 20 minutes talking about it, but then that'd be the complete sharing time, and I don't want to waste it on that. So I'm going to say it's something contextually, and we're going to like focus on verse 3. Verse 3 seems to tell us that a fool is telling everyone he is fool, a fool along the road. So let's say you're traveling. If you're telling someone while you're traveling that you're a fool, that doesn't seem very, a very wise thing. In a, wise, in, a, in a modern context or an ancient context, it does not seem like a good idea to announce that you're a fool uh, as you're traveling along. And that just seems to be a recipe to be taken, taken advantage of. And then as we move to verse 4, we're kind of pivoting, and out of the blue, we see a shift to it saying, hey, if you make the ruler mad, stay out of the way and hide. Now, if we rewind a little bit to the previous verses and look at the ideas of little things can have big consequences and fools run their mouth while traveling, maybe what this verse is kind of saying is if you dig yourself into a hole, stop digging. Don't make things worse. So... Calmness can lay great offenses to rest, so maybe talk less. As we get to verse 5 through 7, we're still talking about the ruler, but this is kind of what's weird. Is the ruler making error? And there's a, lot of, there's a couple inversions here, so maybe what they're trying to do is this. Yes, there are fools who rise to power, while others, aka, aka the rich, humbly sit in their lower place. While those fools are in power, they may elevate their followers, and while others bide their time in lower post. So that's where you see slaves on horseback, they're elevated while the princes go on foot. Which kind of is interesting because that kind of is in contrast to what I was saying earlier. Monarchy good, but here it's saying, well, we have some bad kings. But as you'll see later in, you know, the book of Kings, there are some bad rulers. So what Solomon's calling out here could be, hey, there can be rulers that are bad or just uh, of folly, which kind of follows along the whole theme of Ecclesiastes that everything is sad and meaningless, meaning, yep, we're going to have bad rulers too, and you're just going to have to suck it up. As we go to verse 8, here we're seeing a couple contrasts for jobs and tasks and the injuries you can get by doing those jobs. So what you're seeing is an application of wisely applying your skills and unwisely applying your skills. For example, in all of those jobs, there's some specialization, and if you do it incorrectly, you can easily get hurt. And then the next slide, this is the craziest one of all. If a snake bites before it is charmed, the charmer char rece receives no fee. So... This one, you know, this, this really didn't make much sense to me. And so what I did next was, let me look at a couple different translations. So first one's the NIV. Then we have the NLT. If a snake bites before you charm it, what's the use of a snake charmer? Well, there's no money involved there, so that's interesting. Um, the NASB, there is no profit for the charmer. Okay, that's a little different. There, okay, no fee, no profit. Uh, the NCV, if the snake bites before it is tamed, what good is the tamer? Okay. Well, there's no money there, but what good is the tamer? Okay, no, okay, I got four different ones here. Okay, let's try a couple more. Uh, the King James, surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. Okay, well, well how about the new, new King James? A serpent may bite when it is not charmed. The babbler is no different. <sighs> and the last one, the serpent bites before it is charmed. There is no advantage in the charmer. Okay, so... If anything, what we're learning here is this is a weird verse. 
lots of times when you have weird verses in the Bible, there's a lot to unpack there. It's also teaching us we're not reading this in the original language. Um, so lots of times the biblical interpreters or translators are going to have to come up with what do we think this means. Now, this is also only one verse, so you know we could look before and after to get more context, but you just saw what we saw before this. Uh, we were talking about jobs. Well, eh, snake charming is kind of a job, but yeah, this is still, still not making sense. So maybe we can go back to verses 8 through 10. In verses 8 through 10, there's some jobs that are dangerous to the unwise. So let's think about snake charming and maybe follow that on a line of thinking. A snake charmer uses music or words to disarm the snake. So another fun rabbit trail is snake charming is actually just really hocus pocus anyways. So, and here, here's the fun, fun little fact. Snakes have really bad hearing. They have the basic mechanics for hearing, but it's inside their head. Snakes don't have ears. Like they have the stuff for hearing inside their ears. So they don't have external ears. So snakes really can't hear. So when a snake charmer is doing their thing, they're not really hearing it, but they kind of are. Because they have the mechanics for hearing inside their ear, they are sensitive to sound vibrations. So what snakes are really sensitive to are like lower frequencies or, um, or sound vibrations. So back to the snake charming. So maybe the King James is actually giving us a hint of what's hap happening. So when we see the King James, a babbler is no different and a babbler is no better. So a fool babbling may be no better than the snake that strikes that can't be enchanted anyways. So let's, let's flip it around a little bit and let's say, let's replace a snake for the king, which is kind of an insult, but eh, let's not, let's, let's, let's just bear with me there. What maybe they're saying is, don't babble in front of the king. So, okay, we're talking about talking, not babbling, not doing stuff in front of the king. So, okay, we're starting to get a theme here. So let's keep on going to verse, verse 12. So as you're going through verses 12 through 15, we see this trend of how to wisely use your words. So in these verses here, um, it, it's just talking about wisely using your words, fools multiplying words. On to 16, 16 and 17 sit in contrast to one another. You see a king who is a servant with pre, wh whose princes are feasting in the morning. So if you're feasting in the morning, that means you're probably drinking in the morning, drinking alcohol, not doing wise things. So you're not going to have a clear head throughout the day. Blessed is the land whose king is of noble birth and whose princes eat at proper time for strength and not drunkenness. So what they're saying is, you know, there's a time and a place for doing the right and proper things. And then we have 18 and 19. 18 and 19 are ruling, are, are warning to the rulers. In 18, we see negligence can cost you. In 19, being too indulgent is also not good. So thinking money fixes all of your problems instead of wisdom is also not a good thing. So I will agree, money can fix some problems, but if you think money is a crutch that will fix all of your problem, it's a lot like what Jesus is kind of intending in uh, the Sermon on the Mount in, um, in Matthew 6, 19. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, if you listen to the Bible Project, um, they're actually going through a year uh, right now through the, uh, uh, through the whole Sermon on the Mount. And they talked about this recently. And do not store up yourselves treasures on earth. Now, the Bible Project actually says it's okay to have some wealth, but the key is, is do not treasure the treasure. Don't lean on like, I have this wealth over here and I'm going to like look at it and laud over it and love it and make sure it's going to keep me well and be loving with it because it will just eventually go away. So now that you have it, don't treasure it. So don't think treasures are the good life of abundance. So let's reverse, go back to verse 19 here. And money 
is the answer for everything. And in that light, money can help you, but it is not the be all and everything. God is our source of abundance. So we see treasuring the treasury, treasuring that treasure is of folly. And then lastly, verse 20. So because we can have unwise rulers in verses 18 and 19, we should be careful with our words. Those words can be disparaging to the king and therefore disparaging to us. So an unwise king could do bad things to me regardless of if I said something wise. Flip it on its head, there could be, um, I could be a fool and just be babbling and be disparaging towards the king. Either way could work. So naturally, the conclusion we can draw from this, whether you're fool or wise, whether the king is fool or wise, don't speak badly about the king. Because those words, however soft they may be, can make their way back to the king and therefore tarnish the reputation in, in the king's eyes. Or worse, the king could have inflict punishment on me for saying any of those things because kings have the absolute power. So, that's our lesson for the day. Don't speak badly about the king. Sounds cut and dry, totally applicable today for everything we have to do so we can close in prayer and just go home. Uh, obviously, you know I'm speaking hyperbolically there. I'm just kidding. So how do we apply this lesson today? We don't live in a monarchy. And I'll say it again. I do find it interesting that we have this passage on our July 4th holiday weekend. We, as in people in the United States, and now other countries too, of course, have a freedom of speech. So just back to our situation and just sit in the U.S. right now, we live in a country where we can criticize the president, we can pr criticize our governor, we can uh, uh, criticize any of our elected positions. We can protest under the right conditions um, and not be subject to violence or repercussions by the government. Totally different than back in the day. So, okay, I I'm going to keep on harping on this. How do we apply the lesson that we should not criticize the government in fear of retribution, even though today, in our context, we have freedom of speech, we're allowed to do that, and in fact, we're almost sometimes even encouraged to do that. Is the Bible telling us, is, is it, it's even somewhat encouraging, you know, the Bible's telling us the opposite of kind of what society is allowing, the, of, of what we can do today. So I, you see me getting flustered with my words because like, there's this like tension of like, what are we supposed to be doing? And maybe, Maybe this tension, this frustration, this confusing, this babbling on my part the, of the fool, maybe that is kind of asking the wrong question. Maybe our question is, what am I a citizen of? And guess what? What am I a citizen of? And say it with me. Jesus changes everything. So Jesus is our king. And let's look at Paul. Let's look at Paul, what he wrote in Philippians. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. So Jesus is our king. We are happen to be citizens in the United States, but Jesus is our king. Jesus is our ruler. Jesus is, is our Lord. So I could also have fun in saying, you know, um, yeah, do not disparage the king, oh, King Jesus. And if I would disparage the King Jesus, um, well, I would wager I would actually be in a position of a fool. So I'm not going to say the bad things about King Jesus. So maybe that's our application for the day. But I'm just still making a joke there. So b back to being more serious. Jesus is our one and true Savior. He died on the cross for our freedom and the freedom to be free from sin. We need to take the lead of 1 Peter in um, 1 Peter chapter 2, um, 12 through 14. So the question is, is, how are we going to live in this freedom? How do we live that, you know, Jesus is our king and we happen to be living in an empire? Peter's, 1 Peter says, live good, such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us, the second coming. 
Submit yourselves to the, for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme authority or to the governors sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. So there's a lot to unpack there. I'm not going to uh, beat this to death, but, you know, in verse 12, what we're saying is live the good lives, do what Jesus did. Then look at the government around us, and if there's laws, yes, we need to follow them. But we can do th that in such a way that we can do what Peter, uh, what, what Paul kind of wrote uh, back in his letters. What I'm going to do, say now is not new ideas. Paul, in his old letters, uh, he's, uh, he's giving instructions to the early Christian church. He says how to live within the culture, within the law, but strategically break out of those cultural norms to present a better way to live in love like Jesus. So we need to re be reminded that we need to follow Jesus, not some earthly leader. We need to live in love like Jesus. Alternatively, alternatively, as we live in a country and adhere to the laws in this country, we should not be tooting, you know, the woohoo, yay, um, USA July 4th horn, but we can uh, personally appreciate that we are lucky to live in a country like the United States. There's nothing wrong with saying like, yeah, I'm blessed um, that I can have my freedom of religion. I can practice, you know, uh, from a Mennonite perspective, I was, uh, used to go to a Presbyterian church. I used to uh, be Catholic, uh, great, raised and grown up. I have the opportunity to look for Jesus in all of those strains. And in some countries, you might, not, you might be stuck with one Christian faith and not any of the others. We're lucky that we can, we can follow Jesus how we see fit. But that freedom also has a duality to it. While we have an incredible freedom to follow Jesus in any denomination or any way we see fit, people also have the incredible freedom to not do any of these things either. So, that means as Christians, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to bring the good news to them. But we need to be savvy about it. We need to take, we cannot take over society, we cannot take over the government and drag people to the cross. We need to invite them to the cross. We need to invite them to know that experience a life with Jesus is a much better life. And with that being said, the band can come up now, and I'm going to call, I'm going to close with us in prayer. Um, but before I do that, I just want to emphasize that, um, no, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, so Jesus, thank you for being our king. Thank you for coming, becoming flesh to dwell among us, to bring wisdom, to teach us how to follow it, to follow your way. While we may not always get things right, we know that you will always forgive us. All we need to do is repent and ask for forgiveness. We love you, Jesus. And we cannot wait for you to be with us in the new heaven and new earth. Amen.